is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. China CPI holds near zero in May as producer prices slide, chewing calls for PBOC rate cuts, while European stocks marginally lower after the S&P 500 entered a bull market. Donald Trump is said to have been indicted over his refusal to return classified documents found at his Florida home. The former president hit back. It's election interference at the highest level. There's never been anything like what's happened. I'm an innocent man. I'm an innocent person. Plus, new central bank governor President Erdogan appoints a new head of Turkey's central bank, a move that may signal a return to traditional monetary policy. Stocks are higher even as the lira continues to slide. Now, this is a market across the board. Uh, in the last 10 minutes or so, we also had that deal between UBS and Credit Suisse finalizing a $10 billion loss guarantee deal. That clears a major hurdle to closing the historic takeover, and it could come as soon as Monday. Now, it's not really having an impact on either, well, on UBS, really. We'll look further down the field to see Turkish Lira, our third headline, to see whether the new um, Turkish central banker will go for a more normal policy like we were accustomed to maybe eight, nine years ago. For the moment, Turkish Lira 23.5005. And then we're seeing quite a lot of volatility for these European stocks. S&P futures down two-tenths of 8%. So that's your market check. We'll, we'll have, of course, a full roundup of what we're seeing with inflation across the board. Let's also get some of the other stories that we're watching out for. Now, UBS, we understand, of course, will assume the first 5 billion francs of losses. The government's stepping up to take on the next 9 billion billion francs. UBS uh, gaining some one-tenth of a percent. So that's the very latest. We uh, have talked about UBS Credit Suisse. We've also uh, talked about uh, some of the markets. Also, China's inflation remained close to zero in May. That provides fresh evidence that the world's second largest economy is cooling. The data will strengthen calls by some for China's central bank to cut rates to spur growth. Let's speak to Claudia Panseri, UBS Global Wealth Management's Head of Equity Strategies and Tactical Asset Allocation. Claudia, as always, great to speak to you. What's your take on China? What will PBOC do next? Thank you. Thank you, Francine, for having me today. So I think if it's coming, wow. something is coming through from the POBC will be a good news. The market has started to stabilize a bit uh, already last week when we had the first uh, announcement of uh, deposit rate cut and some fiscal support coming to support uh, the property market. I think uh, with China trading this morning at 9.9 times 12 month forward earnings will be a good support, I think, uh, for the Chinese reopening story. You know, we are positive on emerging market and emerging market have not been performing very well since the beginning of the year. At China, they are performing in line with most of the other region, DM, especially Eurozone, uh, Switzerland. But clearly, uh, China has been uh, the weakest part of the emerging market so far. So we are hoping some for some fiscal support coming. So, uh, Claudia, overall, do, I mean, do you see quite a lot of opportunities out there? I don't know whether the economy will be much worse or much better than expected globally. Are, are we underestimating how many hawkish comments we'll get from the Fed? I mean, the market is underestimating, I think, the hawkish coming out of different central banks. The RBA a surprise on the upside two weeks ago. The Bank of Canada surprise on the upside this week. Uh, the both hiking rates when the rates were expected to be flat and not uh, moving. Clearly, I think uh, now there is a big expectation that the Fed will not move next week. And at the same part, uh, same part, uh, some part of the market like tech and growth stocks are performing quite strongly. So there is a decoupling between growth name and rates. But I also think that uh, the risk of recession in the near term is being pushed forward. So the combination of the pause uh, uh, out of the Fed uh, with the data and employment market, which remain pretty strong, is making people thinking that a soft landing is still possible. Um, uh, Claudia, where do you see the, the biggest opportunity then when you look at you know, some of the wealth management's 
I guess, con con not confusion, but certainly questions about earnings and the fact that we hear from chief executives that there's something ugly coming. But for the moment, earnings have held up pretty strong. Where do you see the best value for money? Listen, if I can make a statement which is important, we have been used to look at nominal uh, earnings and nominal earnings in the past uh, were a clear picture of the economy reflecting exactly what the economy was doing. This time around is the real earnings which give the real picture. Uh, real earnings are already down 7%. Of course, inflation is important, but if inflation has peaked, we may start to see some pressure on nominal earnings as well. That said, I think there are plenty of opportunities in this market. We were mentioning before emerging market. Let's say the Fed uh, stop hiking and we are in soft lending. Then Chinese stocks, emerging market stocks are too cheap. Uh, then if I think about global sector, there are some sectors, I was listening and reading something on Shoring on Bloomberg this morning, speaking about semiconductor and fiscal support. You don't not, not only have onshore benefiting to semiconductor, onshoring and fiscal support also is benefiting to industrials. And industrial valuation is much less expensive than tech names. It is a secular growth sector, which is trading at multiple around 15 times. It's clear a, a big opportunity with a secular growth. And then if you think about uh, more defensive, uh, there are some defensive sectors like utilities, which are usually are not, uh, let's say, very appealing over the long term. But tactically, I think utility sector is the right place to be at the global level. Um, Claudia, I was going to ask you actually what region, and if it is at a global level, is, is there more opportunities if they're, for ex example, expo exposed in certain emerging markets or elsewhere? I will say emerging market, particularly because valuation is cheap and we are expecting a dollar depreciation by the end of the year. But I will also say the rest of the world versus US is very appealing. So we are negative on US, neutral uh, on uh, Europe, and most preferred on emerging market and Australia. But clearly, the rest of the world is more appealing than US. So if people have been performing well uh, since the beginning of the year, thanks to their exposure to US and tech, I think it's probably time to cut down a bit and look uh, in some area where, where uh, there is still uh, some upside opportunities. Claudia, is there something that actually at the moment you'd rather sell off? Is there something that looks expensive and overbought and possibly in a bubble? I think, listen, the IT, the pure IT sector is very expensive today. You are trading some names above 25 times. There is a big decoupling between uh, this name and real rates. I think uh, for some names, the revaluation re and re-rating is justified because there is visibility on growth, but not all tech names are defensive. Part of the tech is very cyclical. So if we are entering a new asset slowdown, this part will be put under pressure and then earn expectation will be slashed back again. So I will say be very uh, tactical, be cutting expensive name, check the earnings cyclicality. These is all elements are important to be well diversified when the economy is slowing down. Uh, uh, Claudia, what's the right way to look at your tech exposure? The right way, I will say, be defensive on tech. Uh, software are more expensive than semis. Semis have been uh, performing already extremely well. Valuation are really high. So be defensively exposed and be exposed to secular growth within tech, which is still cheap, like internet. All right, Claudia, thank you so much. Claudia Panseri, UBS Global Wealth Management's Head of Equity Strategies and Tactical asset allocation. Now, we're just getting a bit of breaking news from Italy. The April industrial output falling some 1.9% month on month. Um, we had estimated a 0.2% increase, so that's much worse than expected. Coming up, Trump charged. Well, the former president is said to be indicted again, but this time he faces federal charges. We'll have the details next, and this is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacroix like here in London. Now, Bloomberg understands that Donald Trump has been indicted over his alleged refusal to return classified documents found at his Florida home. A former U.S. president has never been charged with committing federal crimes. Now, Trump lashed out against the indictment in a video posted on his social media platform. It's election interference at the highest level. There's never been anything like what's happened. I'm an innocent man. I'm an innocent person. And we will fight this out just like we've been fighting for seven years. It would be wonderful if we could f devote our full time to making America great again. And that's exactly what we did. But now, again, our country is in decline. We're a failing nation. And this is what they do. Well, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Ross Matheson. So, Ross, first of all, what do we know about the charges? Well, we know there are seven charges involved, and they range from obstructing justice to concealing documents to retaining documents um, to making false statements. That's quite a, a litany of stuff that's lined up against him. We'll get more details probably later today. Those documents are likely to be released ahead of Donald Trump potentially showing up in court as soon as Tuesday. They relate obviously back to the fact that they found these classified documents scattered around his personal estate, not just once, but several times relating to defence, uh, relating to international, relation, rela international relations. Yeah. These are highly classified documents. Um, so these are serious charges that are potentially against him. But Ross, does this actually give us more of a, give him more of a platform? To, to campaign for 2024, or does it hurt his chances of becoming the Republican nomination? Well, as you saw, he's coming out swinging already, and in other civil cases against him, he's done the same. And we've seen those in some way potentially give him that momentum. They're rallying his base. He's certainly leading in opinion polls in the Republican pack as they start to get towards the primary season. The question is, does it really stay with just his base? Do moderate Republicans, as time goes on, if this gets very messy, do they start to move away from him? But Donald Trump is the sort of politician who confounds expectations and the sorts of things you think would normally damage a politician can actually help him. So it's quite possible that it actually does give him continued momentum in that race to become the Republican nominee. And staying with the US, so the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak also finished his two-day trip. He kind of got bits and pieces from President Biden, but did he actually get enough? Well, he got lots of different individual deals with which they're packaging up and saying, hey, presto, look, we did get a lot, <laughs> including potentially subsidies, you know, access for UK companies. But he didn't get his trade deal. And he certainly didn't get a sense of any inclination from the US to engage on a trade deal. There's no sense that Joe Biden wants to talk about it properly into the US election campaign that it's really off the table. And so that's something that the UK government's been agitating for for a while. Uh, there's no sign at all they're going to get it at all, at least in the near term. But, uh, Ros, will Rishi Sunak come back home and sell it as, you know, getting more than we expected or will it be seen as a failure? There was almost never any chance that, they, that he'd get a trade deal. There was very little chance he was going to get much traction on a trade deal. You can see an effort by the US to sort of give him something because, of course, he and Joe Biden have quite a good relationship, certainly better than Boris Johnson had with the US administration. And so there's a sense of trying to do some stuff together, be it on AI, defence companies and so on. So these are not tiny deals that he got, but they're not the trade deal. Ross, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Ross Matheson there on politics. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News with Sarah Holt. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Francine. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has named Gaya Erkan as governor of the country's central bank. It's a move that may signal a return to more conventional monetary policy after years of ultra-low borrowing costs and rampant inflation. Erkan is a former U.S. banking executive and will be the fifth person to hold the job since 2019. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and President Joe Biden have agreed to start work on a deal that could ultimately give UK firms access to the massive package of US green subsidies and tax breaks. Wrapping up a two-day US visit by Sunak, the two nations also agreed to recognise each other's data protection regime and said they'd cooperate more closely on civil nuclear power and bolstering supply chains. Ukraine's new tanks and fighting vehicles from Western allies are beginning to appear on the battlefield. Amid speculation, Kiev's long-awaited counter-offensive is getting underway. Photos appear to show German-made Leopard tanks and U.S. Bradley fighting vehicles pushing towards the town in Ukraine's occupied south. It remains unclear whether the operations are part of a counter-offensive or an effort to expose weak spots in Russian defences. 
Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Sarah Halls and this is Bloomberg. Francine. Sarah, thank you so much. Now coming up, fresh allegations have led some of the world's largest investment banks distancing themselves from hedge fund manager Crispin Odie. We'll get all of the details next and this is Bloomberg. predicted recession that hasn't happened yet uh, and may not happen. When capital reprices this aggressively, mm -hmm. you know, things do break. And we've seen some sign of, signs of that, and there's more things to dislocate ahead. I think we will get a recession, but it might not be as dramatic and as sharp as the fear of the recession. <laughs> the uh, investing and operating environment has changed so dramatically in the last 18 months. There are many business plans and strategic paths to value creation that have not been refreshed and have not been updated for the fact that the cost of capital is dramatically higher. If you want to paint a more cautious picture, you would say we might have a mini stagflationary scenario. It might not be massive stagflation, but if you have sluggish growth, 1% plus minus growth, and inflation doesn't really get down below 3%, and rates have to stay 3 plus percent for a while, that's not going to feel, it's not going to be called a recession, but it's not going to feel great. Now, those were speakers from the Bloomberg Invest Conference in New York weighing in on recession fears and the challenges of capital costs. Now, some of the world's largest also investment banks have started distancing themselves from hedge fund manager Crispin Odie. This comes after fresh allegations of sexual assault against women over several decades. A law firm representing Odie has strenuously disputed the allegations. Now, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Nishant Kumar. Nishant, so what's new here? Uh, this is really a continuation of uh, various media houses publishing similar stories over the last three, four years. Uh, it, it, Financial Times has discovered many more examples. Uh, the new allegations rolling Odie and his firm today are the latest in that series only. Uh, in, in 2021, he was acquitted of assault charges in British court, but soon after that, you know, two women came forward to Bloomberg News, uh, and we reported that. Uh, following that, Tortoise Media had a similar story. Uh, they shed light on a few more cases. Sunday Times has done that, and now FT has revealed even more instances. Odi denies all those allegations. Last night, the company's CEO uh, came out, wrote uh, a letter to clients, and we broke that news uh, early today morning. And uh, he uh, wrote that uh, his lawyers are looking into the claims and senior management really do not recognize the picture painted uh, in Financial Times uh, report. But essentially what is really different this time is his prime brokers who uh, provide services like settling trades, um, lending money, they are distancing uh, themselves mm -hmm. from OD as a firm. So Morgan Stanley is terminating its prime brokerage relationship, and we have reported J.P. Morgan and Goldman are also reviewing their relationship in light of the recent claims. So Nishant, why Crispin Odi? Why is he always in the limelight? Well, he's the most famous, one of the most famous hedge fund manager UK has ever produced. I think uh, for for years he has been a tabloid for the for everything from uh, his uh, vocal support to Brexit, his lifestyle. He has uh, outrage, he, he has sparked outrage on social media, shorting the pound. He made tens of millions of dollars on a single day on, on that bet and lost it all uh, in a matter of a few weeks. Um, he has been mocked for predictions for doom and gloom during this you know, longest running bull market in history, which ended um, uh, a few years ago. And um, obviously, his fund is always volatile. He makes stunning returns. He loses a lot of money. Uh, he's rich. He's vocal. He's never afraid uh, of uh, talking his mind to the press on politics, on markets, on his fund. And all that makes him really 
uh, this to go to person in the hedge fund world um, uh, in UK. So how, Nishant, is this going to affect the firm? We really need to wait and watch here, essentially. Uh, OD, of course, the name is on the door, but there are many other uh, portfolio managers running their own funds uh, at the firm. Um, so FCA is looking into it. Last time the court case was on, his firm uh, rebranded a number of funds, removed OD's name from uh, those funds and housed them in a separate entity they created called Brook Asset Management. Uh, the firm-wide assets has collapsed to about $3 billion from more than 13 a few years ago. And even uh, most of these assets are housed under funds managed under the Brook entity by different managers. So technically, yeah. technically speaking, the firm's exposure to Crispin is lower than the past. Nishant, thank you so much. Nishant Kumar will have plenty more, of course, on the markets and on this story. This is Bloomberg. China CPI holds near zero in May as producer prices slide, fueling calls for BBOC rate cuts. European stocks marginally lower after the S&P 500 enters a bull market. Donald Trump is said to have been indicted over his refusal to return classified documents found at his Florida home. The former president hits back. It's election interference at the highest level. There's never been anything like what's happened. I'm an innocent man. I'm an innocent person. Plus, new governor President Erdogan appoints a new head of Turkey's central bank, a move that may signal a return to traditional monetary policy. Stocks are higher even as the lira continues its slide. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, we're just getting uh, some more news, actually, on the UBS Credit Suisse deal. This happened about 30 minutes ago, and it does seem like it's the last hurdle before we really get going in terms of putting these two uh, banks together. So UBS has sealed an agreement with the Swiss government to cover 9 billion Swiss francs of losses it could incur from the rescue of Credit Suisse. And this, of course, means that it's a step closer to um, really closing this historic merger. Now, the agreement between the bank and the government was signed on June the 9th and will cover a specific portfolio of Credit Suisse assets and that's about 3% of the combined assets of the merged bank. So that's what we know so far and hasn't really had an impact on the UBS share price because it will be much more about execution of the new group going forward. Bloomberg has also learned that Citigroup has dismantled its global FX strategy team with employees in London and New York leaving the firm. This comes amid a wave of job cuts across the banking industry. Now let's bring in our finance reporter Will Shaw, good morning, Will. So give us a breakdown, first of all, of what's been going on at City's FX strategy team. Good morning. So that team, that team essentially, like you say, is being dismantled. All the everyone on that team is affected. Some people will be staying with the bank, however. Uh, people leaving or expected to leave in, in London and in New York as well. There's some big names in there. So we're seeing people like Ibrahim Rabari who was global head of FX analysis and content, and Vas Jakionakis, um, head of European FX strategy. So they're both among the people who are leaving or expected to leave. And there's something similar as well going on in the Latin American corporate bond team. Uh, that's being dismantled as well at City, um, again, with uh, some people leaving, other people being interviewed for jobs elsewhere in the bank. So what are the reasons for, for, the, for this decision, actually? It seems it's a pretty radical decision. Yeah, I mean, so for the FX team, I think there's a sense that there were other people at the bank, particularly in research, providing more or less the same role and that there's some consolidation going on. Uh, for the Latin American corporate debt team, it's more a question of market dynamics. Um, there's tight liquidity, there's limited issuance in that market. Um, that region has seen returns of 1.3% on corporate debt this year, lagging its peers elsewhere. So it's more to do with the, the wider financial market context. So what is the backdrop to all of this at the company? So we reported in March that Bloomberg had begun cutting um, hundreds of jobs around the world. 
Um, we were told at the time, and I don't think there's any sense that this has radically changed, that these only represented less than 1% of the 240,000 uh, workforce at City um, around the world. So there's not a sense here that there are massive numbers of people being let go. Um, but at the same time, these are quite big people. Their names you might recognise from Bloomberg Television. And if it's, some, if it's something that's happening to you, obviously it's very unpleasant. Yeah, it certainly is. Well, thank you so much. Will Shaw there with the very latest from City. Now, Recep Tayyip Erdogan has named Gaya Erkan as Turkey's new central bank governor. The former U.S. bank executive becomes the first female chief of Turkey's monetary authority. Now, Selva Bahar Baziki from Bloomberg Economics joins us with the very latest. So, Selva, what do we know about the new governor and her, governor and her policies down the road? Morning. Erkan uh, has a PhD in financial engineering uh, from Princeton. She has uh, worked on Wall Street before. She's a bank executive that worked in um, Goldman Sachs and First Republic Bank. So putting the, her background uh, together suggests that uh, a return to orthodoxy is imminent. But don't just take that one appointment as a sign. It's actually started earlier with Mehmet Şimşek being appointed as Minister of Finance. And his statements since then, underlining a need to return to rational policy making and compliance with international rules. So both of these appointments together signal to us that um, not only is a pivot imminent, which was a position we've held since last year, but also it might be arriving sooner than anticipated. We expect the central bank to rate interest rates uh, already in its next meeting scheduled for June 22nd. So, how have the markets read into Erdogan's appointment? Um, Erdogan's appointment was actually speculated days uh, leading up to it, uh, so it's difficult to judge exactly how the markets have uh, reacted to that. Also, because the previous governor is now appointed as the head of banking regulation and supervision agency, uh, two appointments happening all uh, within the same day. But one can definitely say with Shimshek's appointment earlier, um, and his statements in favor of a policy pivot have definitely moved uh, the CDS for the country uh, lower to levels that were even lower than the ones seen before the um, first leg of the presidential elections earlier in May. Um, the lira, however, has uh, seen a really sharp negative movement. On Wednesday, the lira is uh, depreciated by about 7% uh, against the U.S. dollar. And that was because it was reported that the central bank had stopped its stealth currency market interventions uh, in favor of the lira. Um, we calculate these interventions have totaled 177 billion U.S. dollars since the last currency crisis of December 21 through April this year. So what we envision the central bank doing is raising the rates first, communicating a first commitment uh, to price stability, and then uh, moving on to removing these rules and regulations that are in place to support the lira to weather the storm of its loose stance uh, on the currency so far. Selva, thank you so much. Selva Bahar Baziki there from Bloomberg Economics. Now let's get straight to Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Sarah Halls. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Francine. UBS has sealed an agreement with the Swiss government to cover 9 billion francs of losses it could incur from the rescue of Credit Suisse. The government says the agreement was signed today and will cover a specific portfolio of Credit Suisse assets, which corresponds to 3% of the combined assets of the merged bank. The deal removes one of the final hurdles to closing the historic takeover. China's inflation remained close to zero in May, given the central bank's scope to ease monetary policy. Consumer prices were 0.2% higher than a year ago, in line with forecasts. Producer prices dropped 4.6% more than expected on the back of lower commodity prices and weak domestic and foreign demand. And General Motors has become the latest auto giant to join Tesla's electric vehicle charging network. CEO Mary Barra says the deal will allow its EVs to gain access to 12,000 Tesla supercharger ports starting next year. Ford made a similar announcement last month, moving the U.S. auto industry towards a single charging standard. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Sarah Halls, and this is Bloomberg. Sarah, thanks so much. Sarah Halls there here in London. Coming up, the EU spending cash to help reach its ambitions on microchips. We'll discuss that next, and this is Bloomberg.
The global supply chain for high-end semiconductors will soon take a significant turn through a sleepy yet suddenly revitalized southwestern Japan. The world's largest chipmaker, Taiwan Semiconductor, next year will open its latest high-end chip fab, a more than $8 billion behemoth in Kumamoto Prefecture on southern Kyushu Island. Strategically located not only because of where it sits geographically, but because, well, it's not in Taiwan. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway recently divested its entire stake in TSMC, largely because of the threat of China taking over Taiwan as U.S.-China ties deteriorate. We're not looking to decouple from China. We're looking to de-risk and diversify. And that's where Japan steps in. Once a world leader in chip manufacturing, Japan has lost market share to regional rivals, South Korea, Taiwan, and mainland China. The Japanese government wants to reverse that, aiming to triple Made in Japan semiconductors and related materials to $113 billion by 2030. Kyushu was once called Silicon Island, home to many semiconductor companies. The Japanese government hopes that this Silicon Island can be reborn in the future, and I want Kumamoto to be the center of that. Taiwan Semiconductor is not the only major chip maker to consider expanding capacity here in Japan. Fumio Kishida, the Prime Minister of Japan, invited the heads of major chip companies, including TSMC, but also IBM, Intel, Applied Materials, Samsung, also Micron, to the G7 meetings to try and lure them to invest more in Japan. Friendshoring of the global chip supply chain is how some Americans call it. Friendshoring is about deepening relationships and diversifying our supply chains with a greater number of trusted trading partners. Hence, TSMC is also building new fabs in the United States and plans another, possibly in Germany. I do think this attempt by Japan to bring in the semiconductor uh, industry from around the world is, is quite significant in, in terms of not only the economy, but also in terms of uh, strengthening uh, e economic security. For once moribund regional economies like Kumamoto's, the flood of new investment feels like a much-needed transfusion. The recent population growth and rising land prices in industrial areas are among the highest in Japan. Near the TSMC construction site, other major companies are renting rooms for 200,000 yen, an unheard of amount in that area. Adding to concerns about resource shortages and worsening traffic. And yet, after decades of diminished global supply chain relevance, these are problems and new jobs remote Japan may actually welcome. Stephen Engel, Bloomberg News, Hiroshima. Bloomberg, Stephen Engel, they're looking at uh, TSMC's a Japanese plant in Hiroshima. Now, the European Union has approved 8 billion euros for semiconductor research. The projects are also backed by private funding, bringing the total to about 22 billion euros. Competition Commissioner Margaret Vestager discussed the funding approval in a press conference. Uh, microchips, they are the backbone of Europe's uh, industrial competitiveness in a digital world. The green and the digital transition, well, it requires new, advanced technological solutions. And, and this is why we must increase Europe's own chips research, development, production capabilities. So for more, let's go to Bloomberg's Berlin-based tech reporter, Aggie Cantrell. Aggie, good morning again. So will the funding actually help the EU's goal to make 20% of the world's chips? Hi, Francine. So, yes, this funding is a really significant move and is one that has been a long time coming for uh, Europe. This has been something that has been on the cards for a long time. And over the last couple of years, as this has been discussed, as they've been looking at uh, greater subsidies for the industry, we have seen more attraction to Europe as a place to found uh, uh, chip fabs. We've seen, for instance, Intel looking at moving to Magdeburg. And also there has been rumblings, as Stephen Engel pointed out in that package earlier, about TSM see potentially coming to Germany. They're, and of course, for the homegrown chip makers, they are also interested in bolstering their production off the back of such subsidies. And so there is definitely an appeal, and this is definitely a public and private investment in this sector that is doing uh, a lot to drive that forward. But of course, Europe is not the only part of the world that is trying to step up its chip production. So it really is still dealing with the competition from the likes of the US and also from other parts of uh, Asia, 
as a lot of places look to de-risk from the uh, from TSMC in Taiwan. So how much of the EU's chip strategy is actually driven by geopolitical risk, Aggie? So a huge part of it is this de-risking narrative, um, as we have heard from politicians on both sides of the Atlantic, that they need to look at, at how to make sure that these supply chains may remain secure, uh, regardless of any sort of changes in the geopolitical situation in Asia. And so that is a core part of it. But as well as that, as Vestia said in that clip you just showed, it is also about driving the technological advancements that Europe needs. It, it's also about, for instance, the huge amount of demand for chips in, for instance, since AI and in the digital transformations in Europe and also in the energy transition. A lot of the electrification, a lot of the EV charging and uh, other things are going to be focused on building, the building blocks for those things are going to be semiconductor manufacturing. And so it's core for a lot of uh, newer technologies as well. So the money is there, the political will is there. Does Europe have the personnel? This is a really big question for Europe because essentially this big uh, competition to ramp up chip manufacturing across the globe also comes at a time where Europe has for a long time not been investing as much in their chip industry. And there is a big concern where I sit, for instance, in Berlin, that there is a huge labor shortage in the chip manufacturing sector in Germany. For instance, we see as well that in places like Dresden, a lot of the chip where a lot of the chips are built in Germany, there is a concern that there is an aging workforce there and they need to bring in more people. There are discussions about uh, new laws to make it easier to bring in uh, highly skilled workers workers in these sort of sectors from abroad. But it is also a concern that there aren't enough, uh, there isn't enough raw talent and it takes a long time to train people up to do these highly skilled jobs. Aggie, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Aggie Cantrell there in Berlin. Coming up, industries are using generative AI more and more, but there are fears that it could be producing biased to stereotypes of people. So we'll discuss that in our big take. And that's coming up next. And this is Bloomberg. There's likewise a lot of positive impulses. And I think the fact that there's all this cross current, this is the best predicted recession that hasn't happened yet uh, and may not happen. So we're, we're dealing with a lot of cross currents. In our business, that can tend to make clients sit a little bit more in their hands and be a little bit more muted about their positioning and their activity levels. We obviously have tougher capital markets environment. It hasn't been as robust as we saw coming out of the pandemic recovery period. And so what I'm really reflecting in those comments is more about the activity levels and the cross currents and the, the, the continued debate about will we or will we not have a recession? Will we or will we not have rates that stay higher longer, inflation that stays higher longer? And until we get more resolution on that debate, I think we're gonna be in a much more challenging period. I can see scenarios where the second half of the year gets a lot better. We obviously got through the debt ceiling. So last week when I was making those comments, we were on the precipice of getting through the debt ceiling. We've gotten through it. That definitely created, the, the lead up to the debt ceiling debate created a lot of angst and caution in the market for good reasons. We're now through that. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an obstacle that's been moved, moved aside. Now I think really we get back to the primary debate, which is to me is inflation. When I talk to our clients, whether they're corporate clients or investing clients, the single biggest debate that I hear is how sticky will it be and how much is the Fed or the ECB gonna have to do to get it down to you know, it's 2% target in the US terms, let's say, or, or you know, thereabouts in, in European terms. And I think that's a very hard question to answer, and I'm not even sure the Fed at this point understands what, where that has to be. And I think that's, that debate is gonna persist, and that's gonna, it's gonna really weigh on sentiment. How much is the consensus that inflation will be higher for longer, and therefore rates will be too? Well, I, I hear from corporate clients the persistence of inflation in the system. It's felt on the supply side, so whether it's commodity inputs or other supply side inputs, you still feel the supply chain imbalance has, has gotten a lot better. But there's still pretty positive upward bias on pricing in the supply chain. Obviously, wage pressure remains. It's an extremely tight labor market. You know, I often ask myself late at night, can we actually have a recession with 3.5% unemployment? Seems unlikely. Maybe unemployment has to go a lot higher from here. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, but right at the moment, wage and the recent job report was certainly stronger than many of us would have expected. So wage pressure is still there. 
So if you're running a company, you've got higher wage prices, higher supply prices. You've passed along that price pressure to your customers. The customers have generally absorbed it. I sense at the moment more concern in corporate uh, offices and boardrooms about whether you can continue to price that way. Goldman Sachs President Chief Operating Officer John Waldron at Bloomberg Invest in New York saying the U.S. may avoid a recession but still faces the possibility of a mini stagflation. Now, Tom Bravo, co-founder Orlando Bravo, is upbeat about the opportunities he sees in AI. He spoke exclusively to Danny Berger at Super Return, the world's largest private equity conference. On the efficiency side, we believe that by implementing AI, we will be able to increase the margins at, at which we run our companies by about 10 percentage points in general. For every threat that we see, which you can deal with, we see about 10x the number of opportunities. More on AI now. Technology for text to image AI is growing fast with huge investments in many industries such as healthcare and advertising already using it. Early scientific research has shown that the tech is biased by creating images that actually perpetuate stereotypes. That's the subject of today's Bloomberg's big take. So let's bring in Alex Webb. First of all, it's a, it's a fantastic piece, and so we'll push it out also on social media platforms. But Alex, basically, anecdotally, we've heard a lot about this bias. What does the research actually show about it? Well, so what our, our tech and data visualization teams did is they we used stability diffusion or stable diffusion, which is a text to image AI generator, yeah. and they gave it 14 different job prompts and they gave, it did it 300 times yeah. for each job. Seven of those jobs perceived a, a largely sort of higher paying, seven of those jobs lower paying. So in the higher paying bracket, things like politician, judge, CEO, in the lower paying, fast food worker, social worker, janitor. What the data, what the images, what the team found with the images that were generated was that the higher paying jobs were way more likely to produce a result that was someone with a lighter skin tone and male, and that the lower paying jobs were way more likely to produce someone with a darker skin tone and female. So the effect of this is that actually it perpetuates bias even more than maybe a human would. But yeah, that's the thing that's really fascinating about this piece and in a sense quite concerning is that rather than just reflecting stereotypes yeah. it potentially makes accentuates and exacerbates them because one of the data points they pull out is that uh, for judges three yeah. percent of the images generated were of someone they at least perceived as a woman in the US 34 percent of judges are are women so it shows the disparity between reality and and, and the what what is happening here the challenge also is who is using this? Well, advertisers, right? So if you've got advertisers right now using these sort of images, we're going to, there's a risk of seeing way more of these sort of images. I should say the company has said they're working on this. They are working on it. So we'll see whether the, the, them trying to tackle actually leads to anything. Thanks so much as always, Alex Webb from Bloomberg Quick Take, focusing on technology. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Krita Gupta in New York and Edwards here in London. And this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. The S&P 500 enters bull market territory driven by tech-heavy gains. Investors question its sustainability as the bond market ramps up rate hike bets. Deflation risk. China's inflation remained close to zero in May, fueling calls for more stimulus, including rate cuts. And Donald Trump is said to be indicted over his refusal to return classified documents found at his Florida home. The former president says he's innocent. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Happy Friday to you, Kriti. Stocks going nowhere very fast, it would seem. But we have a bull market on the S&P and the air is clearing in New York slowly. It is. So perhaps some reason for a little bit of optimism, a little bit of kind of, well, literally clearing the air, Anna, but you're seeing that kind of sentiment show up in the equity market as well. A little bit of a pullback. Remember, we've had a lot of kind of focus gains, the S&P 500, slight pullback in futures. You are only seeing it down about one-tenth of one percent, 42.94 on those contracts. But I got to say, it's all about the bond market. We are in the countdown to the next Federal Reserve meeting here, less uh, than a few days away. The two-year yield, 
455. So you are seeing a move about higher by about four basis points there. It's interesting, though, as we talk about potential rate cuts in Asia, we're going to get to that in just a moment, but also a lot of these commodity exposed economies talking about rate hikes. To what extent is the Federal Reserve going to have to rip a page out of the global central banking playbook? And of course, that's going to affect the FX story. The dollar, stronger by only one tenth of one percent, is really taking its cue from the bond market here. So as we start to see more volatility going into the Federal Reserve meeting next week, you are going to see the dollar follow as well. To me, Anna, though, the commodity to watch is gold because that's really where you've seen a lot of volatility, first from the debt ceiling story and then from these rate hike bets. Look, if you're seeing more yields in the bond market, is there really a reason to hop into the gold market? That's going to be an interesting cross-asset story. 1962 on the precious metal, but that's just the Western economy a bond market story. Then you go across to Asia, and it's a completely different dynamic, and I think that's worth revisiting because overnight we got some developments, overall some positive sentiment in the Asia-Pacific region, but if you look at the BO Jay, they're saying, look, we're going to stick with our yield curve control policy. There was some questions about whether or not they would reconsider. They're saying, well, not just yet. Nevertheless, creating a little bit of weakness in the Japanese yen, 139.61 on that cross pair. But then at the same time, you have China really talking about kind of uh, inflation that is going into negative territory. So deflation right on the horizon. The effect, though, is interesting because even with those kind of headlines, the commodity story is still quite positive. Iron ore and copper, both in the green, Anna. Yeah, really interesting to see that part of the commodities dynamic then, Chrissy. This is what we have for you on Europe. A really pretty flat picture, actually. And just as I look at it, other parts of the map turning grey right in front of my eyes. So we're really pretty flat here on the European session. It's been kind of choppy, a little bit of volatility as we try to settle into some kind of trading pattern for this Friday morning. Let me take you on and show you some of the highlights. I put UBS in my sort of selection of assets today, not because it's moving very far, because it really isn't, but because they've managed to do a deal with the Swiss government. This was something that was outstanding from their takeover of Credit Suisse. They have managed to agree with the Swiss government that the government will cover 9 billion Swiss francs worth of losses should they occur in the takeover. So that is of interest and sets the stage for more news on Monday when the deal could be done, as soon as Monday, we understand. Crowder International is a chemicals company based in London and their numbers came in below estimates and they've also been talking about destocking by their customers. And so as a result, that stock down by 13% and that really weighs on sentiment for the whole chemical space here in Europe. It is by far and away the worst performing sector here in Europe today. We've got the Turkish lira in focus once again going weaker at 23 uh, Turkish lira to the US dollar right now. We've had a new central bank governor appointed, another markets friendly voice. Uh, this to go alongside the markets friendly finance minister that we now have. How much power will they really have though is clearly a question the market needs to continue to ask. Uh, but for the, for the meantime, the market trading around this idea that perhaps the government steps back from some of its costly intervention policies in FX markets. And here's Brent Crude. Chris, you were talking about some of the other dynamics in the uh, commodity space. And here we have some buoyancy in Brent crude as well. Of course, we saw a lot of downward momentum in oil prices yesterday as a result of some of those news lines being reported elsewhere around Iran. So we'll keep an eye on the supply side, but also on that China demand story. Yeah, well, speaking of the China demand story, Anna, the inflation conversation, a very different dynamic in Asia. Chinese inflation remained close to zero in May, fueling calls for more interest rate cuts to spur the economy's recovery. Joining us now is David Chu, who covers China for Bloomberg Economics. David, walk us through the inflation data. To what extent could we see China actually export deflation? Well, um, I think China is on the on the bridge on, on the at the edge of uh, deflation. Uh, we cannot call it a total deflation now because the CPI itself is still positive, but it's very near to the uh, to the negative uh, territory. So, uh, but on the other hand, you know. Uh, it's, I think it's still too early for uh, to call China's export of deflation from now because uh, if you look at uh, what China experienced in the past several years, actually China's uh, deflation or inflation did not export to the global market significantly. I think there is uh, some mechanism here, but what we are worried is that um, the disinflation or deflation uh, risk is merging and ex uh, in, in China. So that we think uh, there, there must be some uh, policy support uh, needed. OK, so we won't call it a deflation comeback, not just yet. Anyway, uh, let me ask you about that policy support that you see as needed. Does this take us closer to intervention by the PBOC? Uh, well, people are talking about the potential PBOC uh, easing uh, uh, since last week when, China, uh, when the authorities called the big banks to reduce their deposit rates. And the today's uh, inflation data increased the chance uh, for the PBOC to carry it. 
And actually, this recall B, uh, what happened in the year 2014 and 2015 when the PBOC cut the uh, interest rate a lot. Uh, at that time, the, the, the picture was similar as now uh, when we experienced the deflation in PPI and uh, weak CPI. So now this thing, uh, it seems similar. And, uh, but I want to say that the PBOC may also be concerned over the ex exchange rate. Uh, that could be a hurdle for uh, for the PBOC to make decision of of easing, but we believe that the PBOC is going to 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 cut rate uh, because uh, it is like it is similar as the 2014 and 15 yeah. uh, experience. Yeah, and of course widening the gap with perhaps some of the more hawkish bets you are seeing around the world. David Chu of Bloomberg Economics watch, walking us through that crucial global story. We thank you as always. And sticking with the U.S. consequences here, we're going to swift from economics to politics. Former President Trump said to be indicted over his refusal to return classified documents found at his Florida home. He discussed the developments in a video posted to his platform, Truth Social. It's election interference at the highest level. There's never been anything like what's happened I'm an innocent man, I'm an innocent person, and we will fight this out just like we've been fighting for seven years. It would be wonderful if we could f devote our full time to making America great again. And that's exactly what we did. But now, again, our country is in decline. We're a failing nation, and this is what they do. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Rosalind Matheson all over the story. Ros, walk us through the consequences here, the electability of the former president as we head into the 2024 presidential cycle. Well, obviously, this comes as Donald Trump is leading the polls, leading the Republican pack, um, going into the primaries to select their candidate for 2024. He's far ahead of the others, and he's been gaining momentum seemingly on the back of some of these various cases, including the civil cases against him, using it, as you just saw in his video, as a rallying point for his base, saying, this is all a conspiracy targeting me. I'm trying to focus on the important things for America, the economy, and so on, and this is sort of dragging me away from from that. That's obviously going to be his argument going forward. He likes to come out swinging on these things and play to his base. So the question is, does it continue to rally the Republicans behind him over time if, if it does drag on and become particularly messy in the criminal sphere? Does not mean that you see some more moderate Republicans draw away from him and towards some of the many other candidates that are in the pack, obviously, for the Republican nominee? And it's very early days to say that. Yeah, how does this shake things up then ahead of 2024? Rosalind, let's pivot from uh, Washington itself to transatlantic relations. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden met with the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak at the White House yesterday. The two leaders discussed closer economic cooperation. Our economies are seeing perhaps the biggest transformation since the Industrial Revolution as new technologies provide incredible opportunities but also give our adversaries more tools for harm. Um, but one thing I know won't change, I'm confident won't change, is the strength of our partnership, our friendship. We see Sunak, the uh, Prime Minister there, and, and Sunak leaves the US with some deals then, uh, Ros, but not the big trade prize that his Conservative Party had promised. Well, that's right, and expectations were probably low that he was going to get a lot of progress on the trade deal. It's very clear the US administration doesn't regard it as a priority at the moment, and certainly not through the US election campaign for Joe Biden, for example. But they have made it a centrepiece of what they see as their post-Brexit environment. We're free of the EU, free to do our own trade deals, and they want to get those done. So he did come back with some deals, of course, that, you know, including for, for British companies to get access to subsidies, to get access to the defence market in the US. But this is nowhere near the broad kind of nature of, an, of a total FTA and, and the whole kind of free market that they want to get going. So certainly a disappointment that there's no signs at all from the US that they're keen to engage on that. Okay. Okay, so we wait for further progress, see if it ever comes on that particular front. Ros, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Rosalind Matheson with the latest on US and transatlantic politics. Now we go from world, uh, the world of politics to the world of crypto as Binance US is being cut off from its banking partners after the SEC lawsuit that we covered earlier this week. Joining us now is the Bloomberg senior crypto editor, Anna Herrera. Anna, uh, what does it mean then for Binance US? What's happening here? Yeah, so Binance has not had an easy week, right? You said they were sued by the SEC at the start of the week. This means that in practice, like any client that wants to start trading on Binance at US, their US platform will have to do so if they already have crypto, which means you can't take any dollars and start buying 
Bitcoin on Binance.us and clearly that reduces massively the, the appeal that they might have in the US. And it's an issue that Binance has been facing. Binance, the global platform in many other places around the world, this, this issue with banking. They've seen a loss in banking partners in, in the UK, in Australia recently. So it's, it's clearly like a big, starting to become a big problem for them. And certainly one that has kind of recurring consequences, especially when it comes to the relationship between banking and crypto, as you just pointed out. Why is this such a recurring problem, though, that dates back years? Yeah, obviously, you know, crypto has a bit of a problem with its reputation. Uh, in its early days, it was associated a lot with money laundering, um, you know, buying drugs online. And so banks have been a bit uh, wary of having crypto clients because if you have a, a crypto platform as a client, uh, then you're in trouble if they're not doing any anti-money laundering checks or compliance checks. And so they've, they've decided to take an approach that is quite risk averse. And so crypto firms have struggling around the world to, to gain banking partners. And it's been a big problem. And now it's become even more of a problem because we saw the failure recently of Silvergate and Signature, which were two U.S. banks that were targeting the crypto market specifically. Anna, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Anna Herrera with the latest on crypto. Coming up on the program, the S&P 500 entering bull market territory then as investors await more data and the Fed's decision. We will speak about markets with Matt Maley, Miller Tayback, chief market strategist. Plus, in the auto space, GM joining Ford in the Tesla EV charging network. More on that still ahead. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York alongside Anna Edwards in London. Look, it's official. The S&P 500 has entered a bull market. That is, means 20% gains from its October low. But look, the context is everything here because the, one of the criticisms of this rally is that it has been very concentrated in those big tech-heavy stocks. You've started to see some of those small cats catch up a little bit. But then you got to factor in the Federal Reserve and the macro story as well, the idea that perhaps just as we're getting close to the consensus that the Fed may be near its, the end of its tightening cycle, the bond market ramping up some of its bets. And then you have to factor in the China piece of the equation, the growth story uh, overseas and how that's going to kind of feed through into the U.S. So with all that to digest, are these gains really sustainable? Let's bring in a true expert here, Bloomberg's Valerie Titel, our markets reporter in London, walking us through it. Valerie, connect the dots for me here. What does a stock market investor really need to be thinking about right now? Look, I think they need to be thinking, where is this next leg of the rally coming from? Because if you look at what's priced in for the Fed, the market is still pricing in cuts later this year. I don't think it's going to come from a major monetary policy shift. Where it could potentially come from, Critty, is this pile of money sitting in money markets. Five and a half trillion dollars is now sitting in money market funds. It is a record. And you have to remember, when that money sits in the money market, it ends up sitting at the Fed's repo facility over Overnight. It's technically dead to the financial system. Now, why has that money been pouring in there and what can make it pour out? It poured in there because these money markets, T-bills, for instance, are offering juicy yields at a time when the equity market is struggling. But now there's a good reason to think that the money could be coming out and chasing this equity market rally. I'm sure many people who felt like rock stars buying T-bills at 5% at the beginning of the year are now a bit upset they missed out on this 30% Nasdaq rally. Mm, if the owners of those funds then make assumptions that the NVIDIA and AI rally continues. We'll see what happens with that then, Valerie. How do we square all of this with what we're seeing on the VIX? You know, this, this bull market um, achievement on the S&P coinciding with the VIX at the lowest that we've seen this year, I think. I mean, we, we get to lower and lower levels and people ask more and more whether this is really telling us anything. Yeah, it's really plummeted in the last few weeks. It's now reached a level uh, now back to the pre-pandemic lows. Uh, but look, I think it's telling us that the Fed's near the end of the hiking cycle. Growth and employment are still resilient, and core inflation is really set to deteriorate. It's this soft landing narrative where we're not going to get any major road bumps in growth as the Fed uh, continues to fight inflation. And the fact that Washington can't spook us anymore uh, mm. with the debt ceiling debate. But I, I think the VIX trading this low is another reason and why I'm not afraid to be long the equity market here and think that these returns can continue. Valerie, when we're looking at the global data, though, where is the disconnect between perhaps some of the Chinese export data, the inflation data we're seeing overseas into the U.S. story? Why is that not being priced more aggressively? 
Well, look, Critty, a lot of it arguably is. If you look at what's priced in the front end of the curve, the peak is in August in terms of where they think uh, the Fed's funds rate is going uh, to peak and cuts priced out from there. So if we do get this disinflationary impulse from China and the way that uh, it impacts goods inflation in the U.S., maybe it could help the, the Fed get back to its 2% target. But largely that's already priced into the market, which I think is one of the reasons why this bit of the Fed cycle, this end of the Fed cycle has been so hard to trade uh, when we have this this influx or this this influx of where uh, the, the the Fed funds rate, you know, it, it's just ahead. Maybe we're not there yet, but it's on the horizon. Mm. Are you convinced then about the link between deflationary forces if we get there in China and the rest of the world's inflation experience, Valerie? There's there's more in there than just that, isn't there? Even though we know the workshop to the world obviously does have a big influence. I mean, I know our colleague Mark Cudmore on the Markets Live blog was saying he was spending a lot of time thinking about the El Nino effect, what that does to commodities shortage of commodities perhaps and that then ends up putting inflationary pressure out there once again. Yeah, that's something maybe to consider, but I think the bigger thing when we talk about uh, China and its deflationary impulse is really this, this crisis of confidence that we're seeing in Chinese growth isn't j just about the growth picture. It's where China's headed. Are they still after this export-led uh, driven growth model, or is China perhaps okay with a lower rate of growth uh, and okay with, with sacrificing that growth because they want to build an internally-led consumption-driven economy. Mm. Uh, th that kind of narrative, uh, you know, it has been spooking a lot of foreign investors, but but for the long-term picture of where global growth is headed, if China is definitely headed in some direction where lower growth, then we could see, you know, just a lower inflationary impulse overall. Okay, Valerie, thanks very much. Valerie Titel, our markets reporter, joining us there with thoughts on a number of market themes. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go. Uh, that's the function to use on the Bloomberg Terminal to find the Markets Live blog. This is the This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has picked Hafiz Gaya Erkan as central bank governor. It's a move that may signal a return to more conventional monetary policy. A Goldman Sachs alumnus, Erkan has served as CEO at the recently acquired First Republic Bank and real estate firm Greystone. She will be the fifth person to hold this job since 2019. The lira is trading near a record low as Turkey goes through an overhaul of the government's economic team. Oday Asset Management is in talks with some of the world's largest investment banks, hoping to convince them to stick with the London firm. Several began distancing themselves from Oday after new allegations of sexual assault surfaced against hedge fund manager Crispin Oday. Morgan Stanley is cutting ties, while JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs are said to be reviewing their links with the company. Oday CEO Peter Barton says the firm's lawyers are looking into the claims. UBS has sealed an agreement with the Swiss government to cover $9.9 .9 billion of losses it could incur from the rescue of Credit Suisse. That clears a major hurdle to closing the historic takeover. The agreement covers about 3% of the combined assets of the merged bank. New Yorkers can breathe a little easier today. City environmental officials say the air quality improved overnight to moderate. Still, people are sensitive to pollution. Still being advised to take precautions as well, New York's air quality index improved to 100 on a scale of 0 to 500 earlier today. The reading reached the most serious level of hazardous earlier in the week as smoke from wildfires in Canada moved across the U.S. Northeast. Anna, it's almost fascinating as a New York City local about just how prepared we were for something like this from a purely masking, uh, working indoors, remote schooling perspective. I mean, today, for example, mm. uh, New York City schools will be doing remote learning just for, for everyone's kind of air quality safety. Yeah, it really does uh, shine a spotlight on perhaps the resilience that's been built into uh, developed economies by the learnings from the COVID pandemic, the ability, as you say, to work elsewhere, to work remotely, to study remotely and all the rest. I wonder where the politics goes from here, Chrissy. A really interesting Bloomberg opinion piece by our colleague David Fickling, writing about the Australian experience. Wild, wildfires back at the, the end of the last decade over in Australia, really t changing the politics of climate change in Australia, or at least linked to, to changing that politics. Not necessarily in the ways you can predict, but really fascinating what, to watch that connection. Yeah, absolutely. And something I think you're seeing more prominently in the U.S. in the California side of it as they deal with their own version of, of this crisis.
Yeah, coming up on the programme, we'll get back to the markets. Matt Maley, Chief Market Strategist at Milite, back joins us. S&P 500 then back in a bull market. Does the breadth justify it? What happens if the Fed, uh, well, will the Fed pause this month? Um, will they go back to hiking after that? We'll get to that conversation next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. The S&P 500 has officially entered bull market territory driven by tech-heavy gains. Investors question its sustainability as a bond market ramps up rate hike bets. Deflation risk. China's inflation remained close to zero in May, fueling calls for more stimulus, including rate cuts. And Donald Trump is said to be indicted over his refusal to return classified documents found at his Florida home. The former president says he's innocent. I'm Krita Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Anna, a lot of developments, I have to say, on the geopolitical front, certainly in the politics here stateside when it comes to either the presidential cycle, but as well as a relationship uh, that we have with the UK and others as well. But at the top of the agenda, it comes back to the core. What is the Federal Reserve thinking next week? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of central bank decisions, of course, the, set, the, the, the Fed central to it, but uh, other central banks also next week. And we got lots of surprises this week, didn't we, from the uh, Australians and from the Canadians in terms of the central banking fight against inflation and how that is still a focus and still in train. Uh, so is the skies clear? Just a little bit in New York. Are things looking clearer on equity markets? Well, no, not really. We're still flat here on European stocks. Just disappeared for a moment, but we're flat here on European stocks. You saw it briefly. Uh, we also have a focus on UBS uh, today. We'll show you that share price in just a moment. That stock just edging a little bit higher as UBS managed to do a deal with the Swiss government. There was uh, part of the deal left outstanding when they agreed to buy Credit Suisse. Here we have his back. Up by three-tenths of 1% uh, for the UBS share price today. And they've done this deal with the uh, Swiss government that means 9 billion Swiss francs of losses will be absorbed by the Swiss government if it should be necessary as a result of the takeover of Credit it's so that uh, perhaps adding some upward momentum. We now wait for Monday where we could see that deal being finalised uh, at last. Now, Crowder International is a a chemicals business listed in the UK. The stock is down by 14.2%. Numbers critty came in below expectation. They're talking about destocking by some of their customers, and that's weighing on that sector. So we have the chemical sector, definitely the weakest performer. We have utilities and real estate going a little higher, which is interesting when you think about interest rates. And Brent crude is up by half a percent, 76.30. But of course, we saw downward pressure on oil prices yesterday with all that reporting uh, from elsewhere around what was going on with Iran. That supply side in focus. Also, the demand side, though, out of China in focus today. Yeah, absolutely. And the demand thing that you were talking about, really having a read through, I think, into just how kind of cautious perhaps the equity market is going to be when it comes to those global growth concerns and inflation. Is it inflation that's the driver or recession that's the driver? Regardless, perhaps a little bit of kind of caution in the markets today, although I would say S&P futures not really showing much direction, but also not much momentum to the buy side either. 42.96 on those futures contracts. To me, it's the bond market that's interesting, Anna, as we talk about those central bank decisions from around the world. How much? much does uh, the Bank of Canada, the RBA, and now other central banks as well, which have seen their rate hike bets increase, affect what you're expecting from the Federal Reserve? Nevertheless, the two-year yield higher by about four basis points, 455 on the front end of the curve. And the dollar really taking its cue from that story, the Bloomberg dollar index higher by, let's call it one-tenth of one percent. Again, taking the direction from what the bond market is going to tell us in the absence of any uh, real kind of uh, fundamental news coming out of the United States when it comes to things like its actual economics. Uh, gold, though, is going to be interesting. As we talk about the yield ticking higher and higher, does it really pay to be in the precious metal anymore. 1963, does it still serve as that inflation hedge? Uh, that's certainly something we're going to be uh, keeping an eye on down about one-tenth of one percent, Anna. Uh, that's going to be one of the prominent conversations, at least when you talk about the markets, recession. But for market makers to the world's largest investors, I want you to listen to what panelists at the annual Bloomberg Invest Conference had to say on the topic. This is the best predicted recession that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and may not happen. When capital reprices this aggressively, mm -hmm. you know, things do break. And we've seen some sign of, signs of that. I think we will get a recession, but it might not be as dramatic and as sharp. The uh, investing and operating environment has changed so dramatically in the last 18 months. If you want to paint a more cautious picture, you would say we might have a mini stagflationary scenario. If you have sluggish growth, 1% plus minus growth and inflation doesn't really get down below 3% and rates have to stay 3 plus percent for a while. That's not going to feel, it's not going to be called a recession, but it's not going to feel great.
Joining us now is Matt Maley, Chief Market Strategist at Miller Tabak. Matt, thank you as always for joining us, waking up early this morning. Walk us through this market here. We're kind of getting mixed messages when you're looking at the global data versus what the equity market, the bond market is pricing in. Let's start with the equity story. What is the equity market pricing in? Well, I mean, part of it is just pricing in some of the excess liquidity that we've seen in the marketplace in the last couple of months. Uh, I mean, people see the market go higher and they say, oh, geez, things must be getting better. Uh, but they really haven't been. I mean, uh, if you look at the, at the growth uh, prospects, you see, but you know, we initially we had the huge amount of uh, injection from the from the Fed. We saw the Fed's balance sheet explode higher uh, right after uh, Silicon Valley Bank went under. So they you know, provided some liquidity behind the scenes uh, you know, to, to help for that emergency. That helped the market. I mean, when was the last time the market rallied strongly on a banking crisis? Well, it's because that liquidity came in. Then we had the uh, uh, the situation with the uh, debt ceiling, uh, where the you know suddenly the the uh, uh, Fed was no longer, I'm sorry, the Treasury Department was no longer issuing uh, uh, tre Treasury securities. That helped with liquidity. Uh, and that, of course, that's going to start reversing now, where they're going to start uh, issuing all sorts of, I mean, basically a trillion dollars worth of security. So that liquidity is going to pull back. And so I, I guess my point is, when you sit there, when you, you as you just talked about, uh, Kriti, about uh, what's going on in China, and then you see what we, we hear from on the side with uh, the consumer, which is pulling in their horns, and then, of course, some of the lending, which is starting to contract, mm. this credit contraction, are worried that uh, the economy is going to be slowing going forward, and, and some of this euphoria we've had over the AI stocks is going to fade a little bit. Yeah, so, Matt, do you think that the S&P, then, in a bull market, it looks vulnerable now? I do. And again, that's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, it's had this incredible rally. Uh, but you got to understand, you know, it's interesting hearing some of the uh, the people you've had in, in, uh, this week uh, talking about the economy, obviously these uh, leaders in the financial community talking about that, you know, geez, you know, we, we could be heading for a recession, but it's not going to be as bad. Stagflation is a very uh, is a big concern. But the market is still quite expensive. We're at 19 and a half times earnings, uh, forward earnings on the S&P. 2.3 times sales. And, you know, remember, when we had the, uh, uh, in 2000 to 2003, uh, we had one of the most mild recessions in history, and yet the stock market got clobbered because the stock market was very, very expensive at that time. Now, the stock market is nowhere near as expensive now as it was back then, uh, but I just do think that it still has to come in, even if we don't have, uh, even if we only have a, a mild recession. We've had a reminder this week, a number of reminders, Matt, about the fight against inflation and how it is still live from Australia to Canada and beyond. Uh, do, do you still go with the markets thinking that the Fed just doesn't like to surprise markets, so what is priced in is likely to happen? Yeah, I definitely think so. It would be a big, sh uh, big shock if the Fed uh, raised rates uh, next week. They, they have been very, very good about uh, uh, telegraphing what they're going to do. I mean, they, I guess they have left themselves a little bit of leeway if they really wanted to uh, to raise rates. But uh, yeah, again, we did get that surprise, uh, as you talked about, with uh, Canada and Australia. Uh, but since they've telegraphed it in a certain way, if, if, if they want to send a more hawkish tone, they can have what you know they call that hawkish pause and really you know jawbone uh, things a little bit. But I don't think they'll be raising rates next week. What is the bigger concern for the Federal Reserve here? Are we still talking about inflation, recession, or is liquidity going to be more in focus next week? Well, I mean, the, the, we still have to worry about the, the, the situation with the regional bank crisis. And it's it, the, the, the very good news is that it's not going to cause a, or at least doesn't seem like it's going to cause, a financial crisis. Uh, so the, the, the financial system is not necessarily in jeopardy. But we are seeing that, that is going, it is already starting to have an impact on what's going on uh, in the economy and in, in, in lending. And, you know, we, but so, so, but, uh, you, as Bloomberg was reporting yesterday, uh, Howard Hughes Corporation uh, wanted to finance, uh, wants to finance uh, uh, a, some, some apartment complex. And they went to 48 different lenders, and nobody even proposed any kind of an offer, any kind of a bid. Uh, so we see that that's going to come when credit contracts, the economy uh, ends up slowing down. So uh, they, they want to keep a monitor to see how much, I think the most important thing for them is see what impact the banking crisis is not have on the, on the financial system, but what it's going to have on, on, on uh, the, the contraction of credit in the months ahead. But Matt, how much of that story has already kind of been put in the rear view mirror? Are we concerned more about the contraction of credit or the treasury issuance? I, you know, that's and, and that's the problem is that people aren't really 
uh, focused on it because the market has, has done so well. So I, I guess my point is they're both issues. I, I'm most concerned about the contraction, uh, or sorry, the, the, the drawdown of liquidity we're very, very likely going to see. That's going to have the biggest impact on the market. Longer term, I think it'll be what's going on in the market. I, again, if, if what was going on right now, and people were talking about a mild recession, whatever, and we were trading at 15 times earnings, I'd be much less concerned. But a market's expensive at some point, uh, especially when it's when market's been pushed up artificially by these liquidity issues we've been talking about. Uh, I worry that uh, that when once that starts to remove, and it's going to start being removed, as Stanley Druckenmiller said uh, on Bloomberg this week, uh, it's basically starting to happen now. And uh, so I think in the, in the weeks to come, it's going to be something that's going to be the most important issue to worry about. Matt, thanks very much. Matt Maley of Miller Tabak, thank you for joining us. Coming up on the program, we'll talk about the auto sector. GM following Ford's lead in tapping Tesla's EV superchargers. More on that infrastructure story next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Chrissy Gupta in New York. GM is the latest automaker that will be adapting its EVs to Tesla's superchargers, ensuring that it will become an industry standard in the US. Joining us now is Bloomberg's William Wilkes, who covers transportation and logistics for us and joins us now uh, from Frankfurt. William, thanks so much for bringing us this story. So what's the broader significance of this move here? Anybody who's charged electric vehicles in many parts of Europe will know, uh, you know, there are a range of different chargers available right now. I think that's the um, interesting significance of this, Anna, is that the EV manufacturers are moving towards kind of more standard equipment. And the world, um, the US and Europe need millions and millions of EV chargers. And I think company boardrooms are kind of deciding that, look, we need to come together and, and save costs and make, make this just easier for the consumer. There's still a lot of kind of um, concerns from consumers and drivers about purchasing an electric car and the idea that it's going to be easier to, to charge you'll be able to find your charging points um, in, in more places will, will make them more relaxed about buying an electric vehicle. You know, it's interesting. I've, in Europe, I feel like I see far more charging stations than I see here in the States. You see them in California a little bit, perhaps here and there on the East Coast, but really not widespread quite yet. It's coming at a time uh, that not only follows the same announcement with Ford, but it's coming at a time when Tesla, from a car vehicle sales perspective, is competing with Ford and GM. Talk to us a little bit about the dynamic of kind of rivals turned friends. Well, it's an, it's an interesting one. Actually, if you go to, if you look at what Elon Musk has said in the past, some of it has, he's kind of said that his one of his big missions is to just spur the development of electric vehicles. And quite often he's taken decisions that don't necessarily, from a ruthless kind of Tesla must win logic, don't always um, uh, follow that logic. Uh, and I think in this case it's another one, Tesla's a bit, Tesla ahead on building charging infrastructure and they're quite happy to let that, um, let other car makers take advantage, you know, use some of that infrastructure. And probably, actually, there is that will force the expansion of the electric vehicle market. So in the end, it probably does benefit Tesla. But it's kind of Tesla are letting other car makers uh, use, you know, kind of piggyback a little bit on this. Mm. William, thanks very much. Bloomberg's William Wilkes with the latest on that, uh, well, frenemies, I suppose, story from the auto <laughs> space. Uh, let's turn now to artificial intelligence. AI was on everyone's mind at this week's Bloomberg Invest Conference in New York. Here's what John Waldron, Goldman Sachs president and chief operating officer, had to say about the emerging technology. There's, there's plenty of innovation that we could point to and say there's an enormous opportunity to have, like, another industrial revolution that just might be more of a digital revolution and a science revolution, that could unleash a lot of productivity, but we need something to get more growth in the economy that will allow us to deal with some of the challenges we're going to face. 
That's the investor perspective. For more on AI now, technology for text to image AI is growing fast with huge investments. And many industries, such as healthcare and advertising, are already using this tech. But early scientific research has shown that the tech is biased by creating images that perpetuate stereotypes. And this is the subject of today's Bloomberg Big Take story. Alex Webb joins us now uh, for discussion of the main conclusions from this story. Alex, nice to have you with us. So I suppose anecdotally we've heard a lot about bias before, but this research actually suggests that the technology might be more biased than the world outside that it finds. Yeah, it's a terrific um, visual, visualization by our colleagues on the on the data team and the tech team. What they did was they used um, stable diffusion, which is a uh, text to image generator, as you say, and they looked at 14 job profiles. They then asked the system to generate an image for each of those job profiles. They did it 300 times for each job. Seven of them were higher paying uh, occupations, seven of them were lower paying ones. And the higher paying ones, you know, judges, politicians, uh, CEOs, lawyers and others, lower paying ones, housekeeper, fast food worker and more, they found that the images generated for the higher paying jobs tended to be people with uh, lighter skin and more likely to be male. And then lower paying jobs, uh, darker skin and more likely to be female. So, Alex, what is the effect on ter in terms of it feels like it's perhaps detected early enough to do something about it? How is the industry going to tackle that? Well, this is part of the challenge that the, the acceleration of this is, you know, slightly terrifying. Something needs to happen sooner rather than later. The thing that's fascinating about it is it isn't just sort of reflecting existing stereotypes. It potentially exacerbates them. One interesting data point the story pulled out was that 3% of the images created of judges were of what are perceived, at least, as women. Uh, the, but in the US, 34% of judges are women. It, it really is a far starker difference. These images are already being used, these kinds of image makers, I should say, are already being used in the advertising industry. So, again, we're perpetuating potentially stereotypes if they're used without any sort of checks and balances. And also, there are police forces that might use um, AI-generated images when searching for potential criminals. And, again, we have a similar problem. OK, and um, what, what are companies doing it to push back against criticism here? I suppose they're doing something. Yeah, so um, Stability AI, which is the company that makes Stable Diffusion, says for its part that all AI uh, models have inherent biases that are representative of the data sets on which they're trained. They are open sourcing their models in an effort to let the AI community help them improve this bias evaluation techniques and develop solutions. Uh, there are other companies that are also working on ensuring that if they get images from something like Stable Diffusion, they can analyze them in a way that eliminates bias. So there are several different steps along the way that people are working on to try to improve the situation. Alex, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Alex Webb on this fascinating Big Take story. NI Big Take, if you want to find that on the Bloomberg terminal or you can find it on the Bloomberg website. Coming up on this program, Japan reviving its chip ambitions with a TSMC factory. More on how it will impact the global supply chain next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. TSMC will open its latest high-end factory next year in a region in southwestern Japan. This is a critical piece of Japan's one last push to resurface as a world chip superpower amid escalating U.S.-China trade tensions. Bloomberg's Stephen Engel reports on how this new chip fab affects the global chip supply chain and what this change means for Kumamoto. The global supply chain for high-end semiconductors will soon take a significant turn through a sleepy yet suddenly revitalized southwestern Japan. The world's largest chipmaker, Taiwan Semiconductor, next year will open its latest high-end chip fab, a more than $8 billion behemoth in Kumamoto Prefecture on southern Kyushu Island. Strategically located not only because of where it sits geographically, but because, well, it's not in Taiwan. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway recently divested its entire stake in TSMC, largely because of the threat of China taking over Taiwan as U.S.-China ties deteriorate. We're not looking to decouple from China. We're looking to de-risk and diversify. And that's where Japan steps in. Once a world leader in chip manufacturing, Japan has lost market share to regional rivals, South Korea, Taiwan, and mainland China. 
The Japanese government wants to reverse that, aiming to triple Made in Japan semiconductors and related materials to $113 billion by 2030. Kyushu was once called Silicon Island, home to many semiconductor companies. The Japanese government hopes that this Silicon Island can be reborn in the future, and I want Kumamoto to be the center of that. Taiwan Semiconductor is not the only major chip maker to consider expanding capacity here in Japan. Fumio Kishida, the Prime Minister of Japan, invited the heads of major chip companies, including TSMC, but also IBM, Intel, Applied Materials, Samsung, also Micron, to the G7 meetings to try and lure them to invest more in Japan. Friendshoring of the global chip supply chain is how some Americans call it. Friendshoring is about deepening relationships and diversifying our supply chains with a greater number of trusted trading partners. Hence, TSMC is also building new fabs in the United States and plans another, possibly in Germany. I do think this attempt by Japan to bring in the semiconductor uh, industry from around the world is, is quite significant in, in terms of not only the economy, but also in terms of uh, strengthening uh, e economic security. For once more abundant regional economies like Kumamoto's, the flood of new investment feels like a much-needed transfusion. The recent population growth and rising land prices in industrial areas are among the highest in Japan. Near the TSMC construction site, other major companies are renting rooms for 200,000 yen, an unheard of amount in that area. Adding to concerns about resource shortages and worsening traffic. And yet, after decades of diminished global supply chain relevance, these are problems and new jobs remote Japan may actually welcome. Stephen Engel, Bloomberg News, Hiroshima. Fascinating uh, deep dive there into TSMC and its plans over there in Japan as alternatives to Taiwan are sought. Really interesting that the EU just this week, just yesterday in fact, approved 8 billion euros of funds to go into chip research in Europe, uh, Chrissy. And this will add up to about 22 billion if you add in the private sector money that's coming in as well. Because the Europeans, of course, have their own ambitions. The EU wants to produce 20% of chips uh, on, the global, on the global stage by 2030. So lots of countries setting those ambitions for 2030 around friendshoring, around securing their supply chains. And those incentives absolutely working on a lot of these American companies, Intel, even Global Foundries, for example, really taking these governments up on their offer. To me, Anna, the story really is how quickly the diversification is coming with this threat on Taiwan. Yeah, really interesting move by Warren Buffett, really focusing attention on that subject, if we needed it, around the geopolitics. That is it for early edition. Surveillance this Friday is ahead with Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab, Binky Chada of Deutsche Bank and Andrew Hollenhorst of City. Plenty more to come then on this Friday. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>